If you're new to our church, we're finishing up a six-week series about the words that we speak. We've been talking for the past six, uh, five weeks, and today is week six as we conclude about the words that we speak, and this whole series has been called, Watch Your Mouth. Because many of us know that the stuff that comes out of our mouths affects the lives that we live. In fact, how many of us would agree that the words that we speak have power? Would you say amen to that? And you've seen that. Proverbs tells us the tongue is the power of life and death, and those who love it will eat its fruit. So what kind of words are coming out of your mouth? We've got to watch our mouths. In fact, just to recap, in case you missed any of it, here's what we've been talking about. Not only does the tongue have the power of life and death, but even more so, the source of our words comes from our hearts and our reputation, what people think about us. We based on, yes, what we do, but also what we say. Are you a person, a man or woman of your word? Can we count on you to be trusted? Last week, we talked about grumbling, how you have a grumbling, 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 gossipy, gossipy, gossipy kind of thing that takes over at times when we're discontented with life and how gratitude, gratefulness is really a counteraction against grumbling hearts that we have and these words of grumbling that can easily come out. But to put a bookend on all of this, these are all words that we say. If you missed any of those, check out our podcast or on YouTube or at our website, metrochristianchurch.com. And those are all words that we say to finish this series. I think it's important that we not just talk about what we say, but words that we receive, words that we take in. Because the past five weeks have been words that come out. As we finish up the importance of how powerful our words can be, think about what words are you bringing in. So here's a question to start us off. Whose words do you listen to the most? Whose words resonate within your heart and your spirit? When they say something, it kind of reverberates a little bit more inside of you. Whether it's people that are influential or famous, whether it's people that are in your life that have a stronger opinion, whose words influence you the most? For some of us, it could be leaders in our industry. And when they say a certain thing, everybody listens. For some of us, it could be the family matriarch or the grandfather or the dad or mother-in-law. It's a family member whose words influence us the most. For others of us, it's things that we see on media, on social media, on different places of the sort because in an era of podcasts and YouTubers and people who are being famous for saying things that are really like, whoa, in a hot take kind of soundbite culture, it's almost like the crazier you are, the more clicks you get. And the more clicks you get, the more cash you get because advertisers pour in when people tune into your program, YouTube channel, social account, whatever it is. The monetization of crazy takes makes our sensationalization of media even more prevalent in today's day and age. So what happens in the world we live in? We sensationalize everything from the hottest product launches to red carpet this or that as we talked about last week with gossip TV shows like TMZ, did you hear about? Oh, I want to hear. Because the more we sensationalize it, the more people listen. The latest takes on athletes and their performance or lack thereof in a game. I'm still crying that my USC Trojans lost yesterday, but still yet, fight on, we will. To who should I start in fantasy? All these kind of hot takes. It happens through the news, through sports, through talk radio. And whether you listen to CNN, NPR, FOX, or Bibbidees, it doesn't even matter because this is the world that we live in. Everybody's got an opinion. And for every Stephen A. Smith or Skip Bayless, there's a Joe Rogan, Tucker Carlson, Rachel Maddow, Huberman, Goggins, etc., etc., etc. It's just a loud and crazy society. Does it ever feel like we're just surrounded by noise? Constant talking and chatter? I tell you, a couple of weeks ago, uh, well, maybe about a month ago, we finally gave in and we bought a minivan. Yes, that's us. Two, two kids and parents, we got, we got a minivan. I said I would never drive a minivan. And I love it. <laughs> it's got so much space. You don't have to open the doors. The doors open themselves. The kids can buckle themselves and they cannot lean over and hit each other. Now they got to reach over the middle seat and hit each other. The only thing you don't get with a minivan is respect. Everybody passes you. It doesn't let you in. That's it. But I tell you what, in the minivan, the best times are when we're in the car and it's quiet. The worst times is when there's noise. 
noise, fighting, yelling, arguing. Mine, no, leave me alone. No, stop, no, no, leave me alone. Stop talking to me. And that's just what Kara tells me, let alone the kids. <laughs> just kidding, just kidding. We're playing the music and there's traffic and there's all this. And I'm like, just be quiet already. For those of us that live in the city, and I'll let you define city, whatever that means to you. You know you live in the city when at 10 p.m. it's commonplace to hear an ambulance go by. That's when you know you live in the city. Our house, I think we live in the city. Uh, even though ambulances don't go by all the time, we live on the upslope of a hill, and our house is kind of higher up, so you got to take steps to get to the top. Because we're up and sound travels up, we're on a bus line. Whenever the bus comes by, it's so loud. In fact, because of our old 1950s style jealousy house where all the windows are open, it's not double wall or anything, whenever the bus comes by, it rumbles the house a little bit. Yeah, for real. And then I, we're watching TV. The kids are asleep. It's like 9, 30, 10 o'clock. I'm trying to watch our show and everything, really getting engaged and involved. And then the, the character in the show has this dramatic, I just wanted to tell you that I, and the bus comes by, I just want to tell you that I rumble, 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 rumble. Like, can I hear? I'm like, what? Huh? Pause. And I knew I got old when I started watching subtitles on every single show that I watch. Because I kind of heal, right? Lean in a little bit. Just noisy. You know you're in the city when there's just noise everywhere. And that's why. We had our men's retreat. You saw that corny video, and it was a lot of fun and some good teaching. Hey, um, insider thing. We use the, the fun stuff, all the laughter, so that guys' hearts would open to what God would say. Because you'd be surprised and how much a heart is open when the mouth is laughing. You know what I mean? And we bring in God's truth and God's word. Many men's hearts were open to what God was saying, and many guys left there changed. But it's funny, being all the way up on the North Shore at Mokuli'i at the men's retreat, how quiet it can be. And not just being in the city, but with a wonderful wife and two great kids and a demanding job and all the things that are happening in my life, let alone in your life, we live in a world of noise, noise, constant feeds, constant notifications, dings, breathe, I am, leave me alone, like all of these things that are just happening. And what's why being out at the men's retreat, being away from it all, under a star-filled North Shore sky, it just, quiet does something. And I had some encounters with God in times of quiet, not just at the retreat, but in times of my life. When the noise cuts out, and we're able to be there together, I had some awesome interactions and conversations with other brothers in the Lord in a time where we were able to be quiet and be around other guys who are all seeking God together. You'd be surprised where some guys can sit next to each other, say not a word, and feel like we bonded closer than any conversation could take us. How you doing? Good. You? Good. Shoots. In our noise-filled world, where every talking head is trying to get us to tune into, subscribe, smash that like button, and get us to tune into what they're doing, it's amazing how we have to ask these questions. Whose words do you listen to the most? In his seminal work of satire on the demonic issues of our world, English author C.S. Lewis writes in the Screwtape Letters, then in the end, demonic forces will make the entire end of the world a large noise. How much more so does God himself want to draw us into the silence? Because here's the problem. Noise can drown out what's most important in our lives. Can it not? Noise can absolutely drown out what's most important. And all of these opinions and pot shots from this side and that side, all of these issues where molehills become mountains because of noise, noise can drown out what's most important in our lives. And as we finish this series on words we say, what about the words that we speak, I'm sorry, that we receive? What about the words that are spoken to us that we receive? Is noise drowning out what's most important in your life? Back in my early 20s, uh, me and the boys, you know, we, uh, I believed in God, but... Um, Wanted to find some wahines. So, you know, me and the boys, we would go night clubbing. Me and Keone and all the other boys, we would go night clubbing. Back in my day, just to date myself a little bit if you're familiar, we go down over here to like World Cafe, and that was like the jam. That's where everybody went to. Some of you old guys know where that's at. Some of you young guys are like, what is that? That was the place to be. Others of you are like, if it's not Studebakers, I don't want it. Okay, for, forget your Studebakers, all right? This was the place to be. I'm in my 20s. We would go down there because, oh, get chicks. Oh, get chicks. Let's go down for the chicks. It's a low huff. 
Friday. We go down over there to World Cafe. We are ready, to, we're ready to, to party and get down. We get inside there, and the music is bumping. You can hear it from the outside. And you see all the pretty girls walking in free of charge, and all the donkeys like us going, oh, how much for get in? Oh, how much for get in? You hear the bass drum. Oh, oh yeah, let's go. Okay, we paid a couple charge. Okay, okay, okay. Get inside, and you just hear the light. You see the lights. You hear the music going. Boom, 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 boom. You hear the bass in your chest. Me and all my friends get to go. Oh yeah, okay. And then all of us guys are like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And we see some girl. Hey. Look those go up. Oh, you think we get chance? Oh, I think we get chance. Hey, come with me. No, no, no. Go by yourself. No, come with me. She get one friend. Okay, I go with you. She go. <laughs> Here's the girls over there. <laughs> Never had phones yet back then, so we just they're, they're just like <laughs> playing hard to get. Come here. You know, all the music is bumping, bumping. Come to these girls, and I cannot hear anything. <laughs> <laughs> hey! Hi! Hi. You wanna dance? Huh? You wanna dance? Thanks, I got them on sale. Yeah, new pants. Yeah, thanks. No, you wanna dance? Okay, I guess. Uh, come with me, come with me. Come. Okay. okay, yeah, yeah, okay, okay. okay. So we're over here, we're dancing. <laughs> Still got it. <laughs> Be dancing and everything, right? And I'm thinking to myself, what is the point of this? Like, what am I trying to do here? Like, I want to get, if I want to, if I want to date somebody, I want to get to know them and like, you know, where to go to school, where, where to work, like, what, what's the name, where they're from, who's your family, social security number, you know, <laughs> tax returns. Like, I don't know what I'm getting into, right? So we're dancing on the dance floor, super loud, super loud, super loud. I'm going, so what's your name? <laughs> huh? What's your name? Can't I hear nothing? Sometimes, take the principle, okay, throw out the bad example. Take the principle. Sometimes the noise around us is so loud, you miss out on what's most important. Okay, throw the nightclub out just, just to get you into the mindset of, What's most important in your life? What is God asking? What is God asking you to make most important in your life? Seriously, think, think about it. What is God asking you to make most important in your life? For some of us, it's our health. For some of us, it's our family. For some of us, it's the pervading negative thoughts that have been weighing us down like an anvil in the middle of the ocean. And God is saying, you got to give attention to this or you're going to sink more. And I'm trying to lift you up, but you got to cut the rope to the anvil. What is the most important thing God is asking you to give attention to? Because the noise will push you away from what's important and distract you to everything else. As the old say, phrase is, the tyranny of the urgent overtakes what's important. And we start giving our attention to everything else that didn't even matter, all the tiny pebbles when we miss out on the big rocks of priorities in our lives. Don't let the noise drown out what's most important. For some of us, it's our marriage. For some of us, it's our purity in the midst of our single years. For some of us, it's a heart to be changed by Jesus so that we live like Jesus. Actually, that should, should be for all of us if we say that we're followers of Jesus. What's most important? I once talked to an older man and I asked him, hey, how do you be a good dad? I want to be a good dad. And he said, start by being a good husband. I said, okay. He said, because the kids will key off of how you treat your wife, okay? Um, how do I do that? And then he said to me, there will always be more money to make. There will always be more opportunities to do. Your kids will never be this young. And you'll never have these years as a family make the best of it. Oh, because the noise tells me to do everything else. The noise distracts me in ways that only the noise and cacophony that Satan brings in to lead us away from what's most important. How do you hear through all the noise? It's hard when there's frustrations and obligations and the stress of life 
It's hard when there's temptations, there's things to do and things to buy and places to go and obligations. Otherwise, if we don't show up, what are they going to think about us? The quick outs of relief to another glass of wine, another episode, another late night and early morning, and it's no wonder that we feel tapped out. How do you hear through all the noise? You've got to tap in to the right voice. Whose voice are you listening to? Whose voice is most influential in your life? Oh, nobody. It's mine. Like, I, I don't listen to anybody. I, it, I'm an independent person. You're fooling yourself because you're giving in to all of the values of the culture that we live in and you're missing out on the values of the kingdom of God. Whose voice are you listening to? For some of us, we're still living under the voice that was spoken to us decades ago by an influential person, family member, coach, teacher, whoever it is, for the better or for the worse. Some of us are riding off of the encouragement that we can, we will, you can do it, and we're seeing that happen. Others of us are carrying on to things that were said to us. I'll never forget when my grandfather, who played a large role as a paternal figure in my life, when my dad wasn't a part of my life, when my grandfather said, you're such a destructive kid. And I remember that. And I remember he said out of frustration to me. And I remember thinking, I guess I just destroy things. I guess I just break things. I guess this is who I am. And that's why it hit home when we were driving in the minivan and my daughter was in the back throwing a tantrum and I'm trying to calm her down nicely, gentle parenting. Hey, it's okay. Calm down. We're going to do something fun. It's going to be good. No, 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 no. Throwing a tantrum, tantrum, tantrum. So I turned the radio on because I'm like, oh, she's drowning out the noise. With more noise. Good idea. I turned the song on. She goes, I don't want to hear the music. It's annoying. And I went, you're annoying. And she went, mm -hmm. oh, I blew it. I blew it. I blew it. I blew it. I did the same thing that was done to me. And I realized, whose voices am I listening to? Because what you take in is what you're going to put out. Jesus tells us what voice to listen to. And it's in John chapter 10. Open your Bibles. Let's take a look. Again, the reason we have the house Bible is if you're new to the Bible, we give you the page number, page 1075. John chapter 10, verse 1. Very truly, I tell you, Pharisees, anyone who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate but climbs in by some other way is a thief and a robber. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes on ahead of them. And his sheep follow him because they know his voice. But they'll never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him because they do not recognize a stranger's voice. Okay, pause time out. Do you see the two characters Jesus is introducing? If you missed it, take a look again. He says, I tell you Pharisees, the one who enters by the, not by the gate but climbs over is a thief and a robber. So thief robber, that's the first guy. He's later called the stranger. Thief robber stranger. The second character is the shepherd. We're going we're gonna to seventh grade English compare and contrast these two characters and see what Jesus is telling us about the voices that we're listening to. Can we do that together? Because under the presence, I'm sorry, under the pretense that whatever voice you're listening to will be important, take a look at verse 3. The gatekeeper opens the gate, the sheep listen to his voice. Okay, that's, that's important. And then look at verse 4. His sheep follow him because they know his voice. If you haven't underlined his sheep follow him because they know his voice in your Bible, would you go ahead and do that right now? His sheep follow him because they know his voice. Why is this important? I'm going to throw up the next slide which contrasts the shepherd and the thief. Take a look at this. The shepherd comes in the right way, through the gate, right? He doesn't jump over the wrong way. That's the thief. The thief comes in the wrong way. He hops the fence. He climbs over the wall. He doesn't come in the right way. The shepherd, the sheep listen to his voice, and the, he knows their names. The thief, his voice sounds different. It's not recognizable. Bottom left, his sheep follow him because they know his voice. Because it's recognizable, they trust him, they follow him. The thief, because it's unrecognizable, the stranger, the sheep will actually say, nope, not going with you. They'll actually run away from, from the thief. Why is this important? Because if you listen to the shepherd, this is God's voice, the voice of the good shepherd then you're going to see that he's going to come in the right way, into your heart, properly. 
He's going to come in in such a way to bring peace and life and assurance, a building of faith, a greater sense of hope. He's going to come in the right way. The thief will come in the wrong way. It's going to be an intrusive thought, hopping the wall of your heart. Last week's sermon, we talked about grumbling thoughts like passing showers. Remember that? Or you can let the shower stick around and become a storm. Let that storm become a tornado that turns into a cyclone of negativity. In a similar manner, the thief will hop over the wall into our hearts like intrusive thoughts saying, well, this is nice, but... Well, everything's good, but wait for the next shoe to drop. Oh, everything's going good, but, you know, something's going to go wrong. There's going to be intrusive negative thought that brings you in. Remember last time when he said, well, every time she does this, you see this is intrusive thought that jumps in and the voice sounds different. Whereas God's voice is trying to bring us life and hope and peace. The voice of the thief is one that is not comforting. It's more panic, frustration, and agitation. It's when you feel your temper start rising and you're not exactly sure why, you might be listening to the wrong voice. You might be giving ear to the voice of the thief who actually has more diabolical things at work for your life in this moment. But the shepherd, the shepherd knows your name, listens to your, uh, you recognize his voice. That's why we want to follow what the shepherd is saying. The thief, we should respond by running away. Get out of there. It's Joseph with Potiphar's wife. Get out of there. Don't even stick around. Don't even stick around. There's times when I, I'm, uh, I'm cruising, I'm watching TV, I'm flipping through the channels, you know. We're getting, it's late at night, I'm cruising through the channels, and a commercial will come on, and I'm like, this, you know, it's something that's kind of scant, uh, scantily clad, girl in bikini, and I'm like, uh, nope, I'm running away from that, not watching that, get that out of here, nope, no thank you. There's going to be times when the thief will say to me, oh, you should, you should watch more of this, or you know what, you should say what you really think, and I'm in a heated argument with someone. And as we get into this argument, it's like, you should say this. And I know that if I say that, oh, I got to walk back a lot after that. No, don't say that. You don't have to say everything you're thinking in an argument. It doesn't get you any farther. Sometimes it puts you back. The voice of the thief will say, just say this. So whose voice do you listen to? So how do you know? How do you know the difference? Well, remember what we just said. The shepherd's voice is familiar. And the thief's voice sounds a little not the same. Let me give you an example. Many of you haven't met my birth mom, but she's amazing. I love her. She raised me most of my life before my dad came back into my life. So as a single mom and her only child, uh, she and I, we were like buddies. Like, you know, she, we did a lot of stuff together. And I got to know my mom really well. And a couple of the things I had inherited from my mom besides my intellect and <laughs> good looks, you know, it's not, from, it's not from my dad. It's from my mom. Is, is um, she has a particular way of blowing her nose. I remember back when the World Cup was in Brazil and they had those big trumpets called vuvuzelas, this long, loud trumpet, like that was super loud. Well, when my mom blows her nose, it sounds like a vuvuzela, like super, like, it's like a, like a sick duck on a train. Like it's, it's, it's very distinct. I've gotten to know my mom's nose blowing. I, I do the same thing. In fact, sometimes when I blow my nose, some of you blow your nose real cute, like, I blow my nose unapologetically. When my kids were young, uh, we put them to bed, and I go take a shower, and in the shower, you know, all the steam, so I blow my nose. Blah, 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 blah. And Kara would come into the bathroom and go, you woke up the kids again. Like, Sorry, I had boogers, my bad. Anyways, um, so I received that, inherited that from my mom, and we used to go Pali Longs or stores, Safeway, like that, and I had this game where, because back in the day, you could just wander around as a kid. Now they just kind of do that. Uh, but I used to do the wander around, play with toys and everything. Meet me at the checkout when, and sometimes on the loudspeaker, Brandon, come meet your mom at the checkout. All right, so before that happened, I'd go looking for my mom. So I had this, I had this method. So there'd be like aisles, yeah, of all the stuff. So I'd look at, nope, nope, nope. And I'd do the whole, whole store. But when I really couldn't find her, I would listen for the Kus Vuvuzela nose. Oh, my mom's over there. Okay, so I'd go around to this, and I'd find, hey, mom. I would know that I was so familiar with the sound. I knew my mom, okay? Now, in a similar but not as gross way, God speaks to our heart in such a way where you know the voice of your shepherd. Now, let's contrast that with the thief. The thief comes, and what he does is he distorts, and his voice is different. It's off. For example, I think all of us have received emails or text messages that sounded like somebody, but it wasn't because it was a scam. 
You ever get those scam texts or emails about from some government organization or some company that you usually buy stuff from, but it just looks off? Some of you, unfortunately, have received emails pretending to be myself, Pastor Elwin, other pastors, because religious figures can often uh, be taken advantage of in using their name or likeness and sending out fake emails. Some of you receive emails and you forward it to me saying, is this you? I'm like, it's not me, delete it. Because they'll, they'll, they'll play off of it. On social, they make fake accounts based off of us. And then they'll DM you or email you and say, uh, these, uh, these scammers will say, hey, so-and-so, um, we're doing this ministry thing. Thank you for praying. Can you send us money for... Hey, by the way, if you ever get those emails and you're wondering if it's us, ask. And secondly, we will never ask you for money like that. And I said, that's not our stuff. We don't do that. We'll never ask you for money through an email. or like That's not how we operate. You notice at our church, we don't even take an official offering. Like... So when it comes to emails and all that stuff, like, no, it's not how we do it. We believe your giving is with you and God. We'll teach on giving in the future, but those kind of emails are scams. They're scams. And if you're watching this and you're scamming people at my church, I hope you get eternal diarrhea. <laughs> you think that burns? Just wait. There's more. People that pray on kupuna and all, like, it's just like, it's horrible. But be wise and read through these texts and emails because it, it, it sounds off. Right? The grammar's weird. The punctuation's weird. Like, it's, it's just not. That's the voice of the thief. It's trying to steal away from what's going on. In fact, let me show you what I'm talking about. Let's continue. We're in verse 6. And if, if none of this makes sense to you, don't worry. Because it didn't make sense to the Pharisees either. And they were super smart. So, verse 6. Jesus used this figure of speech, but the Pharisees did not understand what he was telling them. See? Okay, verse 7. Therefore, Jesus said again, very truly I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who have come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep have not listened to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. Verse 10. Let's read this out loud together. Ready? Go. The thief comes to only steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the have it to the full. If verse 10 is not highlighted in your Bible, you need to do that right now. See, this is why we tell you bring your Bible on Sunday. I want you to have it. David, bring your Bible. I want you to have this. I want you to know. I want you to have this and take this with you. Why? Because you need to remember the promises that God has given us, and this is one of those that defines what voice are you listening to. Jesus continues in verse 11. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Fast forward to verse 14. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep, and my sheep know me. Just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, I lay down my life for the sheep. Friends, why is this so important? Because we just broke down the difference between the shepherd and the thief, how the thief comes in versus how the shepherd comes in. But this is even more important. I want to show you our next slide. This contrasts the most important differences between the thief and the shepherd. Take a look at this. The shepherd provides, which means he leads them to pasture. What does that mean when it comes to an agricultural agrarian society? When well, first century Palestine, the shepherd would take the sheep out of the pen and take them into green areas of grass where they would feed protected. He'd provide for all of their needs. Second thing, the shepherd brings life. And how much life? Like small kind life or like super mega bambucha kind life? How much life? Like little bit kind life? Like, like downsizing because of inflation life? Like shrinkflation used to give you this much but now you only get this much? No, 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 no. Like gravy all over kind life. Like the shepherd comes to bring life to the fullest in every area of our lives. Finally, the shepherd lays his life down for the sheep. Hey, what does the thief come to do? Steal, kill, destroy. Contrast this. The shepherd gives and provides. The thief steals. The shepherd brings life to the fullest. The thief comes to kill life, destroy it with death. The shepherd lays his life down for the sheep. And the thief, he's out to destroy stuff. Just to come in like a wrecking ball. And Miley Cyrus, the whole living room, like a five-year-old throwing a petulant tantrum, knocking over all of the blocks, saying, no, I don't want to. The thief comes in to steal, kill, and destroy. Steal your joy. Kill any hope you had for what God could do. And destroy any future of believing that God can because I believe that he said that he will. 
The thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but stop, hold on, time out. Do not give too much credit to what the devil is trying to do. In John 10, 10, the thief comes to kill, steal, kill, and destroy. Don't forget the other part of the impo most important part of the equation. Jesus says, I have come that they may have, say it with me, they may have life. They may have life in this side of eternity and the other side of eternal life. Yes. Sometimes we give the devil too much credit. He's going to steal, kill, and destroy it. Hey, that's his schemes. But we stand confidently knowing that because of Jesus, some of us here today need to take the confidence of knowing that because of Christ and our faith in him, the works of the devil are moot. It's a giant bucket of five gallons of water poured on a little match that Satan's trying to set our lives on fire. And the water of the Spirit says, nope, not going to do that. Some of us need to take ownership over our lives, the confidence that comes, that knowing because of what Christ has done for me, there is an authority given to us because of Jesus. Do not shy off of the fact that you have complete control over an area of your life when you submit it to God. When you submit it to God and say, this belongs to Jesus. Nope. Temper tantrum, child, sit in the corner. You're not in charge here. The king of kings is here. And he has sovereignty over this part of my life, my heart, and everything else in it. Some of us need to stop just believing in God and start surrendering our lives to him. Therefore, his authority reigns over our lives. Somebody say amen because I'm tired of talking. I really feel like we need to step into the authority God has given us. You believe in God, good. We say this all the time. You believe in God, good. Even the demons believe in God. Are you going to surrender your life and walk in the confidence that he gives us? Or are we just going to keep it as like an intellectual thought? Yeah, God exists. So what about your life? Why are you letting the thief come in and steal your joy, kill your hope, and destroy your future? Let the king of kings come in. Let the shepherd come in and lead you to life. I don't feel like there's very much life happening in my life right now. It's just, it just feels hard and, and tough. And that's life. Life is hard and tough. But the shepherd will lead you in the midst of that towards his goodness, towards his peace, towards his fullness. I don't have much time with you. We have communion today, but I got to show you that the, the, the lies of the thief have been around from the beginning. Turn with me to Genesis 3. In the house Bible, Genesis 3 is on page, guess what page? Guess what page? 3. That's right. Yeah, isn't that great? Isn't that great? I love that. The schemes of the enemy, the devil's plans and his strategies, it's been laid out. We, it's not like we have to wonder, like, what's he trying to do? Like, we know what he's trying to do. He's trying to get us to not believe that God is good. He's trying to get us to not trust God. He's trying to get us not to surrender to God. And it's happened from the beginning. This is the blueprint. Genesis chapter 3. God creates the world, chapter 1. Chapter 2, Adam and Eve, helpmate suitable for you. It's wonderful. Just don't eat from this one tree. What about the other trees? Go for it. Genesis 3. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord made. He said to the woman, Did God really say, You must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, We may eat, fr we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say, You must not eat from the uh, tree that's in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. <laughs> you will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman. God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be open and you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. If you didn't catch it, here, here's, the, here's the schemes of the devil. Did God really say you shouldn't do that? I mean, come on. Now, I wish I could say that uh, the serpent used the excuse, everyone else is doing it, but never had nobody else in the garden, yeah? Like only had Adam and Eve, so that's out. But basically the serpent goes, come on, did God really say... And Eve's like, yeah, yeah, God, God said. Ah, God didn't say that. I mean, God, God didn't mean it like that because he knows that if you did that, then, you know, come on, come on, just, you know. This is the same strategy he uses us today. It's the same strategy in John 10. The thief comes to, to kill, steal, destroy, and lie, and hop the fence, and not the right way in. And You know what it sounds like nowadays? It sounds like this. Do you really have to pay that much taxes? I mean, couldn't you just like, you know, like, you know, just cut that, like, I mean, 
Sex, sex for marriage is such an outdated thing nowadays. Who does that anymore? Like, come on, just, that's how you get to know each other. You live together, you sleep together. Did God really say keep the marriage bed holy and your body is a sacrifice? No. Why are you being so pr- Everyone else is doing it, so come on. Did God really say that you got to watch your mouth? I mean, hey, if they said that to you, you should just fire back, right? I mean, come on. Like, if you don't say that, you got to stand up for yourself. So you, you yeah. Serpent comes in. Did God really say? It's the same scheme. It's to steal your joy, to kill your hope, and to just just destruction of the future God has for you. Did God really say you should suffer unjustly? No, just bounce. Just file. Just leave. Just get out. You're done. No need to stick around. No need to hold on. Why are you holding on to hope? Here's what the, here's what the, the voice of the enemy sounds like nowadays. God cannot be trusted. You tried trusting God. Where has that gotten you? You're still waiting, yeah? Oh, you're still praying for that thing. <laughs> Look at you. This is the voice of the, of the thief, of the enemy. You're still praying for that thing. I thought you said God comes through. Where is he now? You've been following God this whole time, serving, tithing. Oh, my gosh. And look at these problems you're having now. Why are you trusting God? It doesn't seem worth it. Look at all your friends. They don't go to church. Don't they look like they're having way more fun than you? I mean, can God really come through? Or it's a, a lot of thoughts of self-loathing that are dealt with, um, I'm sorry, based on comparison. And you've, you've said it and you've heard it, not just here but in other places. Our, our, our media, social media saturated society has created a comparison level like none other. And it's affecting not just our kids, and we see it in our teenagers, affecting our adults. As we look at our lives and compare them with others and we say, man, you're going to be let down again. Compare it to her, no ways. Compare it to him, you, you wish you had what he had. No one likes you. After this, after what you've done, no one will like you again. You're a failure. You're the worst. And you call yourself a Christian? These are words that the enemy uses to steal and kill and destroy. This is why we need to differentiate between the voice of the shepherd and the voice of the thief. And Jesus is our good shepherd. Somebody say amen to that. Jesus is our good shepherd. What does a good shepherd do? Here's the last uh, verse I want to give you. It's in Psalm 23. It's on page 548. The ever impactful Psalm 23, page 548. Some of you know this psalm like the back of your hand. Others of us, this is new for us. But if we're going to contrast the shepherd with the thief... If we're going to contrast the one that brings life and the one that steals it, then we've got to see how does the shepherd treat us. Psalm 23, verse 1. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. The Lord is my shepherd, some uh, translations say. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. Remember when Jesus said in John 10, I lead them to pasture? He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. Just look at those verses. Doesn't that sound peaceful, full, still? A little more silence, a little less noise. Verse 4. Even though I walk through the darkest valley or the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. By the way, this is extra credit, so you know no more your Bible. Too bad. Okay, verse 5. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Forever. What does the shepherd sound like? Provision. I lack nothing. Rest. I lie down in green pastures. Peace. Quiet waters. Refreshing of the soul. The right paths and glory for his namesake. So, here it is. Will you listen to the shepherd or the thief? Let's just bring it back to Genesis 3, or the serpent. Will you listen to the voice of the shepherd in your life or the serpent? And chances are, if you're not intentionally trying to hear, take in the voice of the shepherd, you're probably giving more audience to the voice of the enemy, the serpent, than you probably think you are. Why is this important? Because words shape who we are. Not just what you say, what you take in. Words shape who we are. 
And if you're not hearing God speak goodness over you, if you're not being saturated with the promises of God, if you're not being reminded that God is faithful and can be trusted, if you're not being reminded to humble ourselves in the sight of the Lord and He will lift us up, then pride, arrogance, self-sufficiency, and all of these things take paramount and precedence. And we start listening to the, sh- the serpent that says, let me trust God, do what you want. As the old adage goes, garbage in, garbage out. You start listening to all these other things, you're going to see that come out in your life. But you start listening to good things, you'll see that come out in your life. When I was in seventh grade, I got my first cassette tape, Dr. Dre, Dre Day, one, two, three into the full. And it was, I started saying all these words that I could never say before, but I was at school, so who was going to stop me, right? I started saying all these words at school. I never said I'm at home because I knew it was going to happen. And then one day, I started, I, I let one of those words slip at home, and then I never said I'm at home again. Because gangster rap is not proper all the time. But whatever was coming in, started coming out. What's coming in? What's coming in? If you are not spending time with your heavenly father, then you are not going to see the goodness of God coming in. So can I ask you this? I think almost all of our phones have a feature that tells you how long you've been on your phone that day, that week. It's called screen time on the iPhone. On the Android, it's called something inferior to screen time, whatever that is. It's in a green bubble, though, so enjoy. Can I ask you this? Your screen time will tell you how long you've been on certain apps. And you pick which app, flavor of the month, whether it's a social, whether it's a this, whether it's YouTube, whatever it is. Can I ask you, if you compare how much time you spend in God's Word to how much time you've been on whatever app that is, how do you reconcile that? Because if you're wondering why you find yourself feeling so bad about life or comparing yourself to others, or feeling stuck in a negative spiral of comparison or grumbling, whatever it is, what are you listening to? What are you taking in? What are you watching? What are you feeding your spirit? And I love that you're with us at church on Sunday. I love that you're here. And I got to tell you, getting into God's word daily is going to help us to grow. One of the seven rhythms of rooted, which is a core part of who we are in disciple making, that upper left is daily devotions. Not weekly devotions, not not. Every day that starts with a T, no, no, it's daily, daily devotions. The other one right next to it is prayer. And I tell you what, it's in those moments of devotion and prayer where you're hearing the voice of the shepherd that God is going to call you into life. He's going to lead you into green pasture. He's going to provide for you. And that leads us to repentance. And all of these other parts of Rooted start with daily devotions and prayer. Our discipleship model is based in on how we do this together. So therefore, I leave you with this. Lean in. Lean in. Lean into the word of what God is trying to tell you. Mother Teresa was asked by author Henry Nouwen, how do I follow Jesus better? And she said, spend one hour a day adoring your Lord in prayer, daily devotions, meditation, whatever it is. And then don't do anything you know that is wrong. And you'll be good. It sounds overly simplistic, doesn't it? Spend one hour a day adoring your Lord. And then if you know something is wrong, don't do it. It's almost like Dwight Schrute. You know, like I, whatever they would, I wouldn't do it. Like, but can we even do that? I don't have an hour, Pastor. I can't, I can't put an hour in. Okay, then, um, honestly, honestly, can you start with 15 minutes? If you don't have 15 minutes, then you don't have time for the voice of the shepherd. And then, garbage in, garbage out. You get what you get. Can you start with 15 minutes? Can you let that grow to 20? Can you let that grow to 30? Can, can you start somewhere? For some of us, this is a call to go back to daily devotions. For others of us, it's a time to start. Here's what we've adopted here at Metro. It's this thing called Bible in One Year. It's a free app. You can download, look it up in Bible in one year. It looks like that. That's the icon. And we like this Bible reading plan because it takes Old Testament, New Testament, and wisdom literature. And then it also reads to you. Some of us have a hard time with following through or, you know, on reading or eyesight or whatever it is. So it actually reads to you. We like this program. We think it's really good. You hear more about this. You've heard about this before. But if you want to hear the voice of your shepherd, it takes leaning in, spending the time. I think we can do this together. Would you agree? Would you say amen to that? Here's what we're going to do. At the end of every series, we take communion together. Here's how we take communion here. In a moment, we're going to pray, and then afterward, the worship team is going to lead us in a song. 
during the song, when you're ready, come up to the tables in the front or the tables in the back. Grab your communion elements, your bread and your cup. Go back to your seat. We're going to take it together. Let's do that. Bow our heads. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, that through all of these things that we've talked about, we can still hear the voice of the shepherd. Help us not to give in to the schemes of the enemy, but rather, with all the noise out there, help us to lean in to hear your voice, to spend the time so that you can whisper life and truth into our hearts. In this moment of communion now, we remember your sacrifice for us, Lord Jesus. We step forward now, remembering that you are truly worthy of it all. We pray this now in Jesus' name. Amen. When you are ready, you can make your way to the tables in the front or the back of the room. Let's sing this together. You're worthy of it all. You're holding the communion. Let's sing it. For from you are all things, and to you are all things. You deserve the glory. Doesn't he deserve the glory? Jesus, you are so worthy. In this moment of communion, we take time to remember that we want to hear your voice, not the voice of the thief or the liar, 
of the serpent of old. No, 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 we reject that now in Jesus' name. And we hold in our hands symbols of your sacrifice for us. Why is Jesus worthy? Because of what you've done, Lord. Thank you for dying for our sins. Thank you for hearing the voice of the Father. And because of that, empowering us now to live as you lived. Thank you for your sacrifice on the cross. We take communion now to remember you. Go ahead and open the bread. You hold this bread in your hand as representation of the body of Christ that was broken for you. And just as much as our sin deserves a punishment, Jesus took that upon himself symbolically now. We remember his sacrifice for us. Go ahead and take the bread. Begin to open the juice. These are kind of tricky, so uh, if you peel off the top wafer, um, you don't need to eat it, okay? If you have a table at home that's kind of off balance, just put this underneath. Um, I had a hard time with this at the last service, to be honest. Okay. Oh, I got mine. Yeah. Okay, everybody got it? Okay. If you have a problem, then ask your neighbor to help you or just, you know what, just chew them. Nah, 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 nah. nah. Hey, be serious. This community, be serious. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What caused the angel of death to literally pass over the homes in Exodus? It's by those that put the blood of the lamb on the doorpost. What does God say? Our sin is red as scarlet, be washed white as snow by the blood of Christ. Behold the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world and by his stripes, by his blood, we are redeemed. What you hold in your hand is not just a cup with juice in it. What you hold in your hand is a representation that because of the blood of Jesus, we stand redeemed. And if we believe that there is no other name by which people will be saved, then we believe that what Jesus did on the cross, his death, his blood spilled, is the blood that bought our salvation. And because of his resurrection, we know that it's true. Therefore, Lord, we take this cup, remembering your blood. We thank you for dying for our sins, that we might have life as you laid your life down like a good shepherd would. We take this now in your honor. Go ahead and take the cup. Do you pray with me? Jesus, we thank you that we are challenged by the words, not this that we say, but the words that we receive. We receive your word now. Speak to us, good shepherd. Our hearts are leaning in. For many of us, we need to make time to hear you. We choose that now. We thank you, Lord, for this time that we get to take communion and to be reminded of what you've done for us. Therefore, our lives are yours. We love you, Lord. We pray this in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. amen. Would you thank our Lord? God is so good, isn't he? Thank you.